for us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Come on, and Almighty Force, you go before. at verses 22 down through uh, 36. 22 down through 36. Hey, before I get there, because um, I'll, I'll forget to, to say this later, I, I put something online. I, I just wanted to say this to you publicly this morning. Thank you for allowing my sweet bride and I to serve you over the last 15 years. Friday, we celebrated our 15 year anniversary. Uh, yeah, you don't have to clap for that. But I, I didn't want this day to go past without just saying thank you. You, di you didn't have to call us. You didn't have to keep us, uh, nor do you steal, but yet you do. And, and you, you've shown us your, your love for us and your support to us. It means the world to us. And so thank you uh, for allowing us the privilege of serving here. John chapter three, verse 22 says this. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea and there he remained with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. That was a big deal, this purification thing. And they came to John, verse 26, and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing and all are coming to him. Um, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. That's a good memory verse for you today. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all, and what he has seen, 
and heard that he testified and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the spirit by measure. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Now he who believes in the son has everlasting life and he who does not believe in the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Lord, in these next moments, we position ourselves at your feet and say, speak to us. Your servants are listening. Oh God, that we would hear you clearly today. And with anticipating faith, say, yes, Lord, I will follow. Lead us now. Speak into our hearts. For it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen and amen. As I indicated, we are speaking about a subject called contentment, contentment in the body of Christ. And, and most, I think, would agree that there, there seems to be very little of the good contentment among us. There, there really is. There's, there, it, it's, it's certainly not what the, the American Christian would be labeled as. Oh, if, oh, they're Christians, they must be content. Matter of fact, it's a subject I, I, I just soon not talk about, you just soon not talk about. It, it, it's, it's no fun. Why? Because we want and want and want and want and want more. Amen. That's the American way. That's, that's kind of what we're, we're fed. That you, and here, here's, here's another spin on it. You deserve more. You ever heard that one? You deserve more. And, and we, we buy into the height. We buy into that because it feeds our flesh. We get restless. We get anxious. We even get depressed and we get discouraged on the journey because we don't have more or we don't have different or my circumstances are not what I had dreamed of. However, we're going to discover as we look here in our text today that there's a reason for this and there's a way also to avoid it and walk in victory. That is my heart for you as a pastor. I want you to not just know Christ, but I want you to, to know how it is that you walk in victory. One of the things I think that we have to consider as a Christ follower is we have to consider our witness to those around us. Amen. We, we, we do. We, it, life's not just about me and our example. If we are one that is walking constantly in discouragement is not only one to be revered, it certainly isn't one to be followed. If you were wanting to say amen, there was a good spot. By the way, let me give a disclaimer, and I always will when I speak on, I'm not talking about clinical depression, okay? Because I know somebody will write me an email later that clinical depression is real. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about circumstantial depression, circumstantial discouragement, circumstantial anxiousness, and if we continue to walk in that, we continue to, to live in that to where we are just constantly on this roller coaster of, man, I'm high and excited and, and not like high as in, you know, but I'm pumped up. And then the next moment, like a switch has been flipped, I'm down in the dumps and I'm discouraged. Listen to me. Our witness is stained over this. So how is it that I get to live this life where regardless of my circumstances that I can still live contented in Christ? So what I'm going to do in these next few moments, I'm going to make three statements to you out of this text that I believe pertain to the Christian life and help us to have a different perspective on our current situation and what our future beholds. Most often what discourages us the most is an inward focus, an inward focus. We're just looking at me. We're just looking at, I, you know, want more. I deserve more. I, whatever. However, we are to live in contentment. I can tell you if we were to sum up the whole thing, I would tell you, we've got to lift our eyes upward to Christ. We've got to 
put our attention, our focus upon him. So statement number one is this. The greatest place on earth is the will of God. The greatest place on earth is the will of God. Some of you thought I was gonna say Disney World. It is not. It, it is, amen, and I've never been there. I, I've been close. Uh, my bride's been there and she says it's wonderful, okay? But I'm just flat telling you, it doesn't compare to the will of God. Now what I did not say, don't write an email over this. I know how y'all think. You can be in the will of God and still be at Disney World. I'm, I'm not saying you can't. I'm, I'm saying, though, that the will of God is the greatest place on earth. John pointed to this when some of these, these jokers came and began to, uh, began to stir up mess with him. Isn't that interesting that all the way back then there were folks wanting to just stir up mess? You ever, you ever been infected by folks just wanting to stir up mess? It's like the, they can't just live in peace. They've just got to stir up mess. You, you ever, anybody from over in this sex, y'all ever heard of that, seen that? You know, it's, it's, isn't that annoying? Here's what they did. John has had unbelievable ministry. Folks just flocking to him off out there in the backwoods and, he, he, he's out there, I mean, he, he, he's in, I mean, he's in the thicket, okay? I've been there in this place where John is, is, is doing these baptisms, and I'm just telling you, it's, it literally is, it's a wilderness. It's a mess out there. And that's, the, that's, he's not on First Street. He's not in downtown Jerusalem. He is in the backwoods of Judea. Yet, he's experienced an incredible amount of ministry success. Now, all of a sudden, the one in whom he had been talking about, pointing to this Jesus, whom they said, and interesting how they described it, the one in whom you said, behold, you remember John's statement? Behold, the Lamb of God. They didn't even go on to say the rest. They said, the one you, whom you said, behold. They said, by the way, that old boy came to town. Looks like he stole your church members. Did you catch what they said? Did you notice that they're all following him? John, John, it doesn't seem like anybody's wanting to follow you anymore. It doesn't seem like, you, like your church is growing. It looks like Jesus' church is growing, but yours is shrinking. Yours is going down. What are they doing? Were they concerned about John? No, they're not concerned about John. They're wanting to stir up mess. Hey, by the way, by the way, that was from hell then, and it's from hell today. Folks just wanting to stir up mess just because, just because. And it was really, you know, the heart of what it was? It was jealousy and discontentedness. I may have made up a word. I don't know if that's a word, but discontent, you got what I'm trying to say. Is that a word? Discontentedness. And jockeys, it is now. Amen. That, that, this is what they're doing. They, they weren't content with where they are spiritually. They were jealous of what Jesus is doing because you, you, you guys know this. They, they were really concerned about his ministry, taking some power away from the Jews. And so the great way that I could do this is I've got I've to go tear one down because they're making implications about Jesus. Have you ever noticed how some people can say something without saying it? It's just implied. It's just, it's how they, they turn a phrase to make you think negatively about someone else. That's what they're doing. And so John answered and said, I love his answer. A man can receive nothing except it's given to him from heaven. What a great way to respond to folks wanting to stir up mess. What John is saying was this. God is ultimately in charge. He's saying, I'm under his lordship. He's the one who makes the assignments. Therefore, I have to recognize the sovereignty of God in the life of my ministry. We've got to do the same, amen? We've got to understand he is the one who assigns me here. He's the one that assigns you there. He's the one that gives us a call. He's the one that says, go this path. And if we can't trust him in that, I promise you, we sure can't trust him for eternity. John's saying, whatever I have, it's given to me by God. 
Preachers battle with this. They're not immune. I can pick on us. It's, it's, it's my right. I'm a preacher. They take their eyes off the sovereignty of God. And what they begin to do, they begin to look at other ministries. They look at other churches. And most often, they're, they're larger churches. They're more prestigious churches. And they start looking and going, well, gosh, why can't I be there? He's off out pastoring at you know, little to no hope Baptist church. Well, how come I can't pastor there where he's at? His, his crowd's bigger. He's, he's got a nicer building. He's got a better budget. He, he don't have any debt. He, he look at how, why couldn't I be there? And then he'll go on to the point to where it becomes envious. You, you understand, envy is envy's a heavy, heavy word in Scripture. Envy's not just I'd like to have what somebody else has. Envy is I want what you have, and I don't want you to have it. I want to take it from you. You, you get what I'm saying? So, so if, if, if Pastor Seth's eating a cheeseburger and I'm looking and, and saying, man, I, oh, I'm telling it makes me hungry for a cheeseburger. I think I'll go get one. That, that's, that's not envy. Envy says, give me yours. I'd look better with the cheeseburger than you are. You've got a wedding coming up. You better quit eating cheeseburgers. <laughs> Amen. You get what I'm throwing down? That, that's, that's envy. And so preachers will do this often. They'll begin to look around. They'll take their eyes off of the call of God on their own life, off of the sovereignty of God, and start looking at other things and begin to lust for it. And if, if not dealt with in its infancy, turns into envy. When we take our eyes off the sovereignty of God, we start looking at other churches as competitors, if we're not careful, even foes, rather than partners and family engaged in the family business. When we put our eyes on the sovereignty of God, we will find contentment no matter where we are. It's always good when you're doing a study like this to, to pause enough to grasp a, a global vision rather than just a local vision. What, what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, often it, when we're dealing with contentment and that kind of thing, here's what we do. We only put it in the context of life around me, not life around the world. You, you see, because if you, if you take it from just life around me and you expand it to life around the world, it, it, it helps, and, and here's why. Because life around the world compared to life around me is drastically, drastically different for those that are serving the Lord. Why? Because around the world, you will find one after the next after the next and the multiplied millions who have so little and yet are thankful for so much. Yet we often find ourselves having so much and are thankful for so little. By the way, I know you like it whenever I pick on the preachers. You're not off the hook either. Amen. Amen, preacher. Say something to us. I think I will. Church members, we do the same, right? It's often we'll, we'll, we'll not be contented with our own church. We'll start looking at other churches. Well, they got a nicer parking lot. They got a nicer building. They've got a, they've got a greater uh, children's ministry, or they, they they've got a greater they've got an orchestra, and and the list will just go on and on and on and on. And and, and I like the pastor up there better. Well, who doesn't? Amen. And and I I just like all these things that they have. Now now listen to me. Listen to me. I want to go back to my title. I I never said that. We should be content with a lesser of any of those things. I said we should be content in them. You see, while we're content in them, we can still improve upon them. If, if their children's ministry is better, we don't leave to go to that. We make ours better. If their parking lot is better, we don't leave to go over there and park. We, we start working on ours, which, by the way, we got a nice one. Amen. Amen. Okay, you get in the list, just goes on and on. Yeah, well, what about the preacher thing? Well, you just better pray, amen? <laughs> My point being is rather than grow this 
discontented spirit in us to where we just get discouraged and anxious and down. How about we stop or start being thankful for the call of God on our life, thankful for all that God's poured into my life, and just say, Lord, I'm telling you, I'm contented in you. You are enough. The highest place, the greatest place on earth is the will of God. Doesn't matter where you are, if you're in the will of God, you're blessed. You're blessed. I love how Adrian Rogers used to say it. I've heard him say it multiple times. If you're in the will, he'd say this to preachers, if you're in the will of God, dear brothers, you'd have to step down to become president of the United States. They tried to say, well, John, sure does look like you're losing it. I just don't know much that would hit the heart of a preacher any more than that. John, you used to be able to draw big crowds. Now, look, you barely could form a committee. John, it looks like that they used to love you. Now, they're all in love with Jesus. John, what happened to your church? You're losing it. Your glory's fading. And John just looks at him and says, a man can't have anything unless he's received it first from God. Statement number two is the greatest purpose on earth is preaching Jesus. The greatest place on earth is the will of God. The greatest purpose on earth is preaching Jesus. Look there in verse 28. He said, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, his joy is, uh, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Here's what he's doing. John is, dis, is, is demonstrating that he had found great joy and purpose in just living out his purpose. That, that was what filled his joy. This is why God sent me and my glory yet still is fading. I, I'm, in, I'm encouraged by that. Let me tell you why I'm encouraged by that. As a preacher of the gospel, as a pastor of a local church, here's what culture would say to us. You're only successful if you're numerically getting bigger each year. You're only successful if your church is bigger this year than it was last year. You're only successful if your budget is growing. You're only successful if you've added more staff. You're only successful if you've built more buildings. Can I just tell you that is a lie from the pits of hell. We are successful when we are faithful to keep our hand on the plow, fulfilling the purpose of God for our life. And by the way, that's not just a preacher thing. That's a child of God thing. Keep our hand on the plow. Be faithful to fulfill the purpose God has given to us. John, in the text, called himself a friend of the bridegroom, meaning he was not a part of the bride of Christ. I don't know if you'd consider this or not. John was not a part of the bride of Christ. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. The church has not been uh, birthed yet. And so John is saying, hey, the, the bride's coming. I'm a friend of the bridegroom. And man, just being here, and I love this, his voice alone brought me incredible joy. So rather than get resentful or jealous, or live in a world of lusting for what he didn't have. John just found joy in doing what he'd been sent to do, which was what? Point others to the light. He said, I told you, I'm not the Messiah. I told you I'm not the Christ. I told you, don't put your hope in me. Put it in the one in whom I'm living for, the one in whom I preach, and his name is Jesus. Our purpose is similar to John's. The difference being John was there pointing people to the one who would come and the one who had now come, yet we live out our purpose when we spend our lives, no matter where we are, no matter our circumstances, pointing others to the one who came and is coming back. That's our purpose. It doesn't matter about your vocation. Often people get this so messed up of, well, I... I 
I'm just in a hard spot and I just, I wish I could just, you know, serve the Lord full time. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you how to get going with that. Start. Just start. That, that, that doesn't mean you change vocations. That, that means that you, you change outlook about the vocation. That, that, that means that, that wherever you are, you begin to be faithful because if you're not listening, oh, this is a good word. Boy, this is a good word. If you're not faithful where you are, why would you expect God would give you another assignment? It's not about the assignment. It's about the faithfulness in the midst of it. Contentment. Lord, I'm contented in you. You are enough. If your, if your joy and your contentment is based on life being just as you had always dreamed it was going to be, you're going to find joy to be unattainable for most, if not all, of your life. Anybody, uh, anybody ever had any dreams crushed? Y'all had any of those? Well, and those of you that haven't, here's what I'm going to say. You're just not old enough. It'll happen. Or you just ain't dreaming, one or the other. It's not about everything being fulfilled. And here's the issue. The issue is why those things crush us is because we think life's about us. We think life's about our happiness. Life's about everything going just like I wanted. And it's just, it's just simply not the case. Rem reminder, the quickest way to discouragement is to live the inward focused life. Let me give you the last statement and we'll go eat something. Y'all hungry? I just live hungry. I don't know. I do. And then I preach myself hungry and then I'm, the time I get home, I'm hangry. My, my kids have taught me a word, hangry. Y'all know what hangry is? Hey. Oh, boy, bless. yes. <laughs> it's sexy. I'm watching you. Amen. Yes, we know. Hurry up and say it. Bless God. <laughs> the greatest place. <laughs> Aren't you glad you get to go to church that we can have good time? Amen. I am. I, I, I'm, I'm thankful. And they, this ain't some stuffy bunch of fuddy-duddies in here. I don't even know what a fuddy-duddy is, but I don't want to be one. Amen? Greatest place on earth. What is it? It's the will of God. Greatest purpose on earth is preaching Jesus. Last one. Greatest peace on earth is the glory of God. Greatest peace on earth is the glory of God. Listen to John's statement. These guys stirring up mess. John... You lost it. You used to be the one headlining conferences, and now, John, you can't even get called upon to preach a funeral. John, they used to love you. John, they were listening to you, and they would come from all over. Now, John, if you had a wife, I bet she wouldn't listen to you. Here's what John said, John 3, 30. He must increase and I must decrease. He must increase. Here, here's a guy. This is one of the reasons why I think that here's what Jesus said about old John. And, and John, John's a, he's a, here's a Thomas Hollerism where I come from. He, John was a woolly booger. Do y'all ever use that phrase, a woolly booger? Now, I don't know what that is either, but he was a, he was a mess. He, an old bushy looking thing. And I mean, he's, he's, he's not been to town. He's living off out there in the bush and and he, he wore this camel hair coat, eating bugs and honey. I like the honey, but I don't like bugs. And, and th this, is, this is John. And, you know, John, you're just, boy, I mean, these other guys are showering now. And John just contended in the call on his life. I don't have to be up there. They, they don't have to come hear me. They, 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 don't, they don't have to come and, and, and sing my name. They, they don't have to be my disciples. I realize my disciples are coming, becoming his disciples more and more every day. Listen to it. He's the one that needs to increase, and I'm going to decrease. As his glory rises, my glory fades. And by the way, John's saying, I got peace about it because that's the way God planned it. 
I've got peace about it. Jealousy, discomfort, discouragement come when we get our peace and peace from achievements and possessions rather than Jesus. Jealousy, discomfort, and discouragement come when we get our peace from achievements and possessions rather than Jesus. And that's often the case in our lives. We, you, we've, got, we've got money now, and, and, and we've got stuff now, and we've achieved some stuff. Now we're at peace. Take that stuff away. Take those achievements away. Add in a few failures along the way. Are you still at peace? Do you still have comfort? Most often, no. Because all we can see is I don't have my stuff, and I don't have my achievements. This is why I'm telling you, listen to the statement. Discouragement discomfort, jealousy, it all comes when we put our peace anchored to our stuff and our achievements rather than Jesus. One of the great peace and contentment robbers that we experience here on earth is the myth that life is all about my happiness and me. I can't even begin to tell you how often it has been over the last 24 years of doing what I'm doing that I've talked to people that are just bewildered that God hasn't protected their dreams or God hasn't protected their happiness or God hasn't protected their marriage and they're shocked. How could this happen to me? How could hard times come my way? I was serving the Lord. Now I've got cancer. I was serving the Lord. Now my marriage is struck. I was serving the Lord. I had money. Now I'm broke. How could it happen to me? A reminder, jealousy, discouragement, and discomfort come when we get our peace from our achievements and our stuff rather than Jesus. One of the things as a Christian in this culture that you're going to have to come to grips with if you want to live a life of contentment is you're not always going to be appreciated. You're not always going to be noticed. You're not always going to be recognized. You're not always going to be rewarded. Here's my question to you. Is the glory of God enough? Is the fact that the master is pleased with you enough? Let me talk to every married couple in here. Every one of you, both men and women, there's going to be times you're not going to be noticed for what you did. There's going to be times you're not going to be appreciated for what you did. There's going to be times that you think nobody cares. I'm going to ask you a question. Is you doing it for the glory of God enough? Now, mind you, Listen, before I can, I can already hear you typing your email on that. Well, I think we ought to make it better. You remember, I said we're contented in, not contented with. Contented with says I ain't going to do anything about it. Contented with says, hey, let's don't make it better. Absolutely make it better if you can. But you don't have to lose yourself in the midst of it. You don't, somebody help me, amen. You don't have to fall apart in the midst of the mess. There will be days that no, listen to, oh, this is a good word. There'll be days nobody's gonna give a rip about what you've done, except the only one that matters. Did you know that? Did you know that? I can clean one cup in my house and I'm wanting to make sure that everybody knows it, amen? Hey, hey, look at here. Y'all see this? I'm banging on pants. I washed a cup. And Bets is over going, I do it every day, you lazy bum. We do so much to get recognized. I'm guilty. I'm guilty as anybody. That's why the Lord got all over me and in preparing this this week, is, is the glory of God enough? 
And by the way, I, I'm talking about your homes. That goes on in church too. You, you know how many people, I've got to quit. I'm out of time. Do you know how many people leave their church because of this very issue? Nobody appreciated me. I mean, I, I just give you one after the next after the next. I'm just serving up there. Nobody cares. I'm just serving up there. And they just, and he, you, know, you know how we mask it? Here, here's, a, here's a word. You've never heard this word. So this is a brand new word for you. They just burn me out. You never heard that one, have you? Not in church. Can, can I just flip that a little bit for you? That's not true. There's a greater chance of you rusting out than there is you burning out. And I'll just let you... Oh, yeah. Is the glory of God... I, I'm, I'm quitting. Is the glory of God and the approval of heaven enough for you? Now, what I'm not doing, I'm not hanging something over here and saying, just hold on. Gals, your husband will start to appreciate someday. You do it long enough and he'll come around. He may be a bum the rest of his life. I don't know. I'm talking about me, okay? I know some of you are like, well, I ain't going back. He just called me a bum. Only if you were one, amen? Okay. I'm not saying if you'll just do it right long enough, it'll always turn out for your good. Because that, that's, a, that's a, a modern spin on bad theology, we have no promise it's all just going to work out. We have no promise it's going to get better. But we have this promise. The glory of God is best seen whenever we live sacrificial lives for him. John gives this example to us. He must increase and I decrease. How that works out is I'm living my life as a servant. It isn't about me. It isn't about my happiness. It isn't about folks uh, heralding my name. It isn't about somebody patting me on the back. It isn't about somebody buying me new gifts. It isn't about somebody just appreciating to their core how good I am. You'd be, you'd be thankful they don't know all about you. Read this story and I'm done. story that happened about a, a violinist. Those are fiddle players where I come from, but a violinist had his concert and did a, a really a magnificent job um, with this. And the people just stood and they, they cheered and, and applauded. And man, they're hooting and shouting, not like Baptists, but you know, like like a Pentecostals. And I mean, they're, they're, they're just fired up. Oh, this violinist, he's so wonderful. And, and he, he steps off to the side of the stage and, and, and he's got his head drooping down. And the folks are just going crazy, you know. And, 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 and this stagehand sees him and they, they, they come over to him and it's like, man, go out there and take a bow. That was amazing. All the people loved what you just did. The violinist replied, not all of them. Do you see that guy down there on the front row with his head hung low? He's my teacher. And if I didn't please him, it doesn't matter who I pleased. It's a picture of our life. You can get applause and you can get folks to stand and encourage you and cheer you on, but listen to me, if we haven't pleased the master, it's all for nothing. You can have all the followers and fans and and, and friends that you can have that are out on the uh, uh, social media world. But listen to me, if it's not pleasing to the master, it'll all be for nothing. We've got to live our lives for the glory of God and the glory of God alone. And here, here, here's a good word for you. And the rest is just bonus. 